Okay, in our video series of cardiology lectures, in this video, we are going to talk about aortic regurgitation. We are going to talk about its clinical presentation, the causes, the diagnosis and management of aortic regurgitation in detail. First of all, we have a case here, a 73-year-old man comes to your clinic and tells you that, Doctor, I have been experiencing shortness of breath for the last few months. On exertion, when I walk, I feel short of breath. Doctor, I also get this pounding sensation in my chest with each and every heartbeat. My heartbeat has become more prominent. And I feel it. Doctor, I also get recurrent headaches. His wife tells you that sometimes I notice that his head is moving with each and every heartbeat. When you auscultate the patient's chest, you listen to a decrescendo murmur, a diastolic murmur. This patient is having aortic regurgitation. What is aortic regurgitation? How do you diagnose it? How do you manage it? Today we are going to talk about that. Now, basically, pulmonary veins take the oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left side of the heart into the left atrium and from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, this blood is pumped to aorta through aortic valve. Then this blood from the aorta is spread out to the whole body. What happens in aortic regurgitation is that this blood that is pumped out to the aorta gushes back into the left ventricle which should not happen, which is abnormal. The blood is gushing back from the aorta into the left ventricle due to abnormality in this valve. This is called as aortic regurgitation. The blood is regurgitating back to the left ventricle after it has been pumped out. This is aortic regurgitation. Incomplete closure of the aortic valve leading to reflux of the blood from the aorta into the left ventricle. This is aortic regurgitation. Now, aortic regurgitation can be acute where it can happen suddenly. It happens suddenly when the patient presents to you with a holosystolic murmur, a decrescendo murmur, and the patient is also having fever in the cases of infective endocarditis. It is the most common cause of that affects the valves and the aortic valves is, are damaged in the infective endocarditis. This results in regurgitation of the valves. This is acute presentation. Aortic dissection, the aortic the false lumen is formed in the aorta, in the ascending aorta, and that false lumen damages the aortic valve, resulting in the aortic regurgitation to take place. And it is the most common aortic cause. Most common valvular cause is infective endocarditis, but most common aortic cause, from where the cause lies in the damage to the aorta, that causes aortic uh, regurgitation. Now, if you want to understand aortic dissection in detail, I have a full video on aortic dissection as well as infective endocarditis. The links of those videos are given in the description below. Coming to the chronic causes, in the chronic causes, patient will have primary valvular defects. Patient can either have a congenital bicuspid valve. Usually there are three cusps present in the aortic valve. Three cusps are present that form the aortic valve. In some patients, there are only two cusps and there are chances that if these two cusps are damaged, there will be aortic regurgitation. Rheumatic heart disease can also cause aortic regurgitation. Aortic dilation occurs especially in the patients with connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome, L.R. Denla syndrome, where these valves are very loose and when these valves are loose, they do not close properly so the blood regurgitates back to the left ventricle. So these are the chronic causes that develop over a period of time, while acute cases develop in infective endocarditis and aortic dissection that happens suddenly. Now if the left ventricle pumps the blood to the aorta, and if there is aortic regurgitation, this blood would gush back toward the left ventricle. Then there will be buildup of pressure in the left ventricle. And then this pressure will be transmitted backwards to the left atrium. And from the left atrium, this pressure will be transmitted towards the pulmonary veins. Therefore, the pulmonary veins that were taking blood to the left atrium cannot take the blood to the left atrium now. And the blood will be backed up. When the blood is backed up in the lungs due to this back pressure building up due to aortic regurgitation, there will be accumulation of blood in the lungs. And whenever there is accumulation of blood and fluid in the lungs, it results in dyspnea. The patient will be having shortness of breath, the same scenario that we had where the patient would come to you with shortness of breath. So dyspnea is a common presentation of aortic regurgitation. Regurgitation of the blood from the aorta to the left ventricle, the LV cannot sufficiently dilate. Therefore, pulmonary edema develops and that results in dyspnea. Everything makes sense when you understand what is going wrong in the body. 
everything goes right when you know what goes wrong. Now, acutely, the patient will develop sudden severe dyspnea. These patients would come to you in emergency department with severe pulmonary edema and you would be giving Lasix to these patients to drain the pulmonary edema in these patients. So, pulmonary edema is a common presentation in these aortic regurgitation patients. In chronic cases where aortic regurgitation is building up over a long period of time, the patient's common complaints are palpitations where they feel the heartbeat pounding all the time. They, they have angina chest pain in chronic cases. Now when the blood from the aorta gushes back into the left ventricle, the left ventricle accommodates that blood and makes space for that blood and it dilates. It dilates to accumulate the extra blood that is coming after the systole that is coming back that is not going ahead. Now, when there is extra blood present over here and the blood is already coming from the pulmonary veins, the left ventricle will be filled up and the left ventricle will be stretched. And remember the Frank Starling mechanism. When the left ventricle is stretched, when the heart tissue is stretched, the more it is stretched, the more forcefully it contracts. Now, when the left ventricle is filled up with more blood, it is more stretched, the next beat is going to be a very forceful one and it will forcefully contract, it will generate a forceful beat. This is very important for you to understand that when it is filled up with more blood due to the Frank Starling mechanism, it will generate more pressure and it will contract more forcefully. When it contracts more forcefully, it will generate a very high systolic blood pressure. When it generates a high systolic pressure, it will generate pounding pulses and the patient will have the pounding pulses. When you check their pulses, you will feel that the carotids are dancing. You will feel that the pulses are very strong. You will, when you touch the femorals, it will, you will feel like these are pistol gun pulses. So the pulses in these patients are pounding. The pulses are very prominent in these patients and they're very strong. This is a very important concept to understand in aortic regurgitation when you are diagnosing a patient with aortic regurgitation. Due to the Frank Starling mechanism, there will be increased pressure with each beat. Therefore, the pulses will be pounding. Therefore, the patient would come to you complaining of pounding of the heart. They would come to you with headaches due to high blood pressure in these patients. Regurgitation of the blood from the aorta into the left ventricle would cause increased systolic blood pressure. Now the systolic blood pressure is high. The systolic blood pressure is up. But as soon as it pumps the blood to the aorta, all the blood comes back. Therefore, the force that it generated causes increased systolic blood pressure. But that systolic blood pressure cannot be maintained. Therefore, sudden drop of blood pressure takes place where all the blood that was pushed to the aorta comes back to the left ventricle. Therefore, there is a decreased diastolic blood pressure. The diastolic blood pressure cannot be maintained because the blood in aorta is coming back to the left ventricle. Therefore, there is increased systolic blood pressure and suddenly there is decreased diastolic blood pressure. Therefore, you would see a wide pulse pressure in these patients. Pulse pressure is the difference of systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. There will be a huge difference. When you will check their blood pressures, these patients will be having Having blood pressure of 180 by 40. There will be a, a huge gap between the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Everything makes sense when you understand the pathophysiology, the disease. To understand medicine, you have to understand that what goes wrong. When you know what goes wrong, you can easily understand that what is happening in the body. So there will be a wide pulse pressure that will be seen in these patients. Now, when you examine these patients, these patients will have dancing carotids. There will be a rapid upstroke due to a rapid systolic peak. And then the blood would gush back from the aorta into the left ventricle, resulting in a sudden downstroke. So you will feel that their carotids are dancing. That is called as Corrigan pulse. When you see the same sign in the uh, femoral arteries, that is called as strobe sign. When you auscultate the femoral artery, what you will listen is that you will listen to sounds like tzz, tzz, tzz. Just because the pulses are so forcefully coming and they are suddenly losing their pressure, therefore you will feel that there someone is shooting with a pistol. 
pistol shot like sounds are heard when you auscultate the patient femoral arteries this is very interesting everything will make sense when you understand the pathophysiology now if you look at the finger tip at the fingernail you will feel the pulsations you can look at the pulsations felt at capillary level in these patients that is called as quinky sign there these patients will have a jerking of the head with each and every heart beat that is called as demoset sign rhythmic nodding of the head with each heart beat these patients will be having the rosiest sign the rosiest sign two and four brewy over the femoral artery when pressure is applied because of the increased pressure of the pulses whenever there is regurgitation of the blood from the aorta into the left ventricle to make space for this extra blood dilated cardiomyopathy occurs in these patient left ventricular enlargement takes place eccentric hypertrophy and whenever there is dilated cardiomyopathy over a long period of time these patients develop heart failure on auscultation you would listen to a high pitched blowing decrescendo early diastolic murmur the murmur will be diastolic and it will be a blowing murmur it will be a very prominent murmur that you would listen in the diastole the murmur sounds like this it is best heard when the patient is sitting up and leaning forward it is best heard at the herb point what is the herb point herb point is the third intercostal space another important point to remember is the austin flint murmur many times in exams you will be tested about austin flint murmur what is austin flint murmur basically when the blood is gushing back from the aorta into the left ventricle at the uh, just before the systole when the blood is gushing uh, from the aorta to the left ventricle it pushes the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and causes closure of the mitral valve that produces a sound that is called as austin flint murmur regurgitant blood strikes the anterior leaflet of mitral valve and results in its closure that results in a murmur called as austin flint murmur it's a pre systolic murmur which happens just before the systole during the diastole period now coming to the diagnosis of aortic regurgitation remember echocardiography is done to diagnose aortic regurgitation now this is a picture of aortic regurgitation see this is the left ventricle and over here is the aorta when the now the blood is being pushed from the left ventricle into the aorta and you, now when i play the video you would see that the blood during the diastole would gush back into the left ventricle now you, uh, carefully see this picture see the blood gushing backward you can again and again play this video and see the blood gushing backwards other investigations that are done include chest x ray and ecg for the treatment of aortic regurgitation remember surgical treatment is the mainstay of treatment surgery is done if the patient presents to you with acute severe aortic regurgitation suddenly patient has developed acute severe regurgitation where there is a huge damage to the aortic valve these patients would need surgery symptomatic chronic severe aortic regurgitation even if the patient is asymptomatic and the patient has chronic severe ar with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction it means that the patient has now developed dilated cardiomyopathy due to this aortic regurgitation if the left uh, left ventricular end systolic diameter is greater than 50 mm it means the patient has developed dilated cardiomyopathy even if the patient is not having symptoms the patient is having such severe ar that it is damaging the heart now or if the patient is going for cardiac surgery for any other indication you are already opening up the chest and that patient has a severe acute uh, uh, severe uh, regurgitation even if the patient is not having symptoms you can repair the aortic valve now these are the indications for surgery what you do is that you you open up the chest and you place a surgical aortic valve an aortic valve is placed the mechanical valve and or prosthetic valve can be placed when you place a mechanical valve you have placed a foreign body in the body when there is, whenever there is a foreign body present in our body our uh, response of our body is to reject that foreign body it results in aggregation of platelets immune system is activated which results in from formation of thrombi and that can result in stenosis of that uh, valve so that is what we do not want therefore we give antithrombotic or anticoagulants in these patients we give warfarin 5 mg per hour daily and we target an inr of around 2 to 3
Remember, you cannot start the warfarin immediately. You have to give a heparin bridge, enoxaparin, or low molecular weight heparin for some period of time till the time you achieve a target INR. Then you start the warfarin. Why do we do so? Because if you do not give heparin bridge, initially uh, warfarin causes a hypercoagulable state and results in thrombi formation. Warfarin is given for lifelong. If the patient is having bioprosthetic valve, bioprosthetic valves are the valves that are made from uh, animal tissues like bovine and pigs. And if they are placed, then aspirin can be given with or without warfarin because they have less chances of uh, getting uh, stimulating the immune system and getting thrombi on them. Medical management. Now, these patients most likely would have developed heart failure. In some cases, you have to manage the heart failure. These patients will be having hypertension. You have to manage the hypertension. Now, how do you manage heart failure? How do you manage hypertension? I've talked about it in detail in my separate videos. You can check out those videos in the cardiology lecture series. Remember, intraaortic balloon pump is contraindicated in acute severe aortic regurgitation. Remember, intraaortic balloon pump is the balloon pump that is placed in the aorta that works functions just like heart. Now, in conditions, there are conditions where heart cannot pump blood to the body, and in such conditions, intraaortic balloon pump is placed in the aorta to pump the blood to the body. So it just functions just like heart. It takes the blood from the aorta and pumps it to the body. Now what happens is that it is generating pressures and we have a leaky valve, a aortic regurgitant valve present in the aorta. Now, if it is generating pressure, it would further cause worsening of the aortic regurgitation and further damage to the heart. Therefore, intra-aortic balloon pumps are contraindicated in acute severe aortic regurgitation. If you like my video, please click on the subscribe button and make sure to check out my other lectures on cardiology series, neurology series, ECG interpretation made easy. I have all playlists that are available on YouTube. You can support this channel on Buy Me A Coffee and make sure to follow me on its Instagram. We talked about what is aortic regurgitation, acute and chronic presentation of aortic regurgitation, the pathophysiology of dyspnea. You do monitoring by serial echo in these patients. Remember, you avoid beta blockers in acute aortic regurgitation. Whenever you are treating these patients, remember you do not give beta blockers. Why don't we give beta blockers? It makes sense because uh, the tachycardia in aortic regurgitation is a preventive mechanism to prevent the uh, regurgitant blood entering from the aorta into the left ventricle. So if you give beta blockers, it will further slow down the heart and there will be a lot of regurgitant blood. There will be a lot of time for the regurgitant blood from the aorta to fill in the left ventricle. Therefore, the tachycardia is technically a preventive mechanism for aortic regurgitation. Therefore, beta blockers are avoided. Dyspnea is a common acute presentation in chronic cases patients develop palpitations. We talked about how uh, pounding pulses are generated when there is increased volume, Frank Starling mechanism is activated and there is increased force of contraction. Therefore, the systolic blood pressures are high, but then the diastolic blood pressures are low. Dancing carotids, pistol shot like guns, quinky sign. We talked about the mustard sign, the rosius sign. We talked about how dilated cardiomyopathy takes place. We talked about the, the high-pitched blowing murmur seen in these patients. Uh, we talked about what is Austin Flint murmur. We talked about echocardiography. We talked about surgery as a mainstay of treatment. Aortic valve replacement is done. And then the anticoagulation is given. How we manage these patients how medical management takes place and we monitor the patient with serial echo. Avoid beta blockers and avoid intra-aortic balloon pump in these patients. If you like my video, please click on the subscribe button. Thank you very much.